Alhamdulillah, you were kafa. Was Salatu was Salamu ala ibadi hilladina kafa. Ususan ala of Dali him were Khatam in Nabiin. Muhammad in the Amin. Wala Adihi was of Bihi at Marin Waba. Fa'audu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim Wa nazzalna alayka al-kitab fibiyanan likulli shay Wa hudan wa rahmatan wa bushra lil-muslimin Sadaqallahu al-Azim Our distinguished uh, chairman in Hajj, a PhD student at UBD I will be very proud, uh, distinguished guests, uh, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters and students, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is always a source of happiness to be back in uh, Brunei Darussalam, particularly because His Majesty the Sultan of this country has declared the black and white, his sincere and earnest desire to enforce the law of Islam, the Sharia, in Brunei. And you want to join with me in making dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may make it easy for him to achieve that noble objective. The Sharia is the foundation of the deed. It encompasses not only the law, which is the criminal law, those acts for which you are punished by the state. It encompasses also the civil law, the law of business personal law. But what we uh, sometimes forget is that it also comprises the moral law. Today we look at the topic, the Quranic foundations and structure of Muslim society in which we examine the Sharia as a whole, which encompasses the moral law. It is based on this book, this two-volume work. Look at the size of these books. Look at the size of these books. Volume 1, Volume 2. The two-volume work entitled The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society. It was written by my teacher of blessed memory, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah, who is an outstanding Islamic scholar of his age. And we were very fortunate to be his students. What he has done is to turn to the Quran as the primary source from which we derive the Sharia, the foundations and the structure of Muslim society. And then he turns to the Hadith. Very importantly, he directs attention to the relationship between the Quran and the Hadith, and we will explain that shortly, inshallah. But most important of all, what he does in this book is to explain the correct methodology 
for the study of the Quran and of the Hadith. If Ikhwan al Muslimun had done that homework, they would not be in the difficult situation in which they are now located in Egypt. So we want to begin with an explanation of that methodology. And since we have PhD students here in this gathering, what are your thinking caps? For Molana, Molana Dr. Ansari is going to take you on a journey. And I am only the medium through which his guidance reaches you. After we have explained the methodology and the relationship between the Quran and the Hadith for the purposes of deriving Sharia. He then directs attention to what may be described as, and now it's a big word I'm going to use, don't be scared, epistemology. The theory of knowledge. <coughs> Does knowledge come only from external observation and experimentation? The scientific inquiry? The Jal, the false messiah, sees with only one eye said the Prophet is left eye. is blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging crib. <laughs> but your Lord is not one eye. This hadith lies at the heart of epistemology. And if you are to penetrate the Qur'an, you better study epistemology. When he sees with his left eye, the left eye symbolizes something. When he's blind in the right eye, the right eye that is blind symbolizes something. We have to be able to distinguish when something which comes from the Quran and Hadith is to be understood literally, literally, and when it has to be interpreted. And that is not always easy. No. The Jal will ride on a donkey, said the Prophet. <laughs> the donkey will travel as fast as the clouds. The donkey will have his ears stretched out wide. For those who insist that only Allah and His Messenger and the Aslaf, Aslaf, plural of Salaf, the early Muslims, only they have the authority to interpret. And if they did not interpret, the implication is that we've got to wait for the flying donkey. And they are waiting for the flying donkey. I am not being abusive. I am not being disrespectful. Disrespectful. Not at all. When I say of the Salafi Islam that they are waiting for the flying donkey, I am not humiliating them. Not at all. So they don't have to respond to me with abusive language and inappropriate language. No. But there are others of us 
who say, no, this is not to be understood literally. The flying donkey is already here. The Prophet sallallahu was referring to an age which will come, which will witness aircraft, fighter aircraft. The river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. The Sanafi insists that since they did not interpret, we are not allowed to do so. And so they are waiting for a mountain of gold to come out from the river Euphrates. We are not being disrespectful to them when we point out this is their position. We understand it differently because of our methodology. We say that that mountain of gold is already here. Oh yes. But it was not possible for us to recognize it before 19... Help me somebody. <coughs> Help me somebody. 19. Come on. You've been listening to me, haven't you? You heard my lecture on the Petrodollar. 1973. <coughs> <73. coughs> when an ocean of oil began to function as a mountain of gold. And the Bretton Woods monetary system was replaced by the petrodollar monetary system which we now have today. It is not easy to distinguish between that which is literal and that which is symbolic. Nabi Isa alayhi salam will return. That's literal. And he will come down with his hands resting on the wings of two angels. That's literal. That's not symbolic. How do we distinguish between the two? When the child sees with the left eye, it symbolizes external vision. And we say that when he is blind in the right eye, it symbolizes internal blindness. Someone should teach this lesson to a Quran in Egypt today. <laughs> Yes, they're my brothers, but well, what can I do? Reckless and misguided. They're my brothers, but well, what can I do? <coughs> and so, in addition to the external sight, the Quran gives an epistemology that we also have internal sight. And Allah speaks in the Qur'an of those who have eyes and yet do not see. They have ears and yet do not hear. <laughs> they have hearts and yet do not understand. And Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ كَلَنْعَمْ Even with a PhD from MIT, they just like that. And Allah says in the Quran, فَإِنَّهَا فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارِ It's not these eyes which are blind. وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي السُّدُورِ What is blind is the heart inside the chest. And so Dr. Ansari argues that you cannot approach the Quran not at all with one eye. 
that there is a spiritual quest that must be pursued. And if you want to pursue that spiritual quest and be blessed by Allah with noor in your heart, noor of course you know is light, and you know that it is not sold in the stock market. <laughs> you know that. Yeah. No government can give it to you. Yahdi Allahu li nurihi man yasha. Allah give grants his nur to whomsoever Allah chooses. If you want to be eligible for internal intuitive <coughs> spiritual insight <coughs> to penetrate the Quran to see what otherwise cannot be seen. You better have backbone. You know there are those who have backbones made of recycled paper. You know that. Oh, no, 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 no. I can't do that, Sheikh. If I do that, I will lose my U.S. visa. If I go on this road, my business will collapse. If I go on that road, they'll put my name on the no-fly list. I won't be able to travel. These are people who have backbones made of recycled paper. If I go on that road, I won't get a job. I never will get promotion. Oh, who are you worshipping? Are you worshipping the one God who can see in your heart? The one who will get no, the one who will succeed in the spiritual quest, is the one who has the courage to proclaim in the solati, wa nusuki, wa mahiyaya, wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Surely my prayer and my service of sacrifice in my very living and my very dying, they're all for you. I will proclaim the truth without regard to consequences. Today, these words, these words resonate in the hearts of the young. The young people can understand this language. The young people love this language. They are inspired by this language. In the salati wa nusuki wa mahiyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. And that perhaps is why ashabul kaf, ashabul kaf, the people of the cave, innahum fityatun amanu bi rabbihim fazidnahum huda they were young people and so I'm happy this is not to say I'm not happy to have the elders with me <laughs> but I'm also an elder many of you are my grandchildren but I'm happy that there are so many young amongst us so Dr. Ansari Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah emphasizes the paramount importance of the spiritual quest for the pursuit of this knowledge. You must be sincere. This heart, this head which bows in worship before Allah will not bow to any other. And then he warns us, warns us about a mistake that will be fatal. Do not go down that road if you want to succeed. And it is a curse that has descended on those who came before us. The curse is called sectarianism. 
that you are labeled. This one is uh, in, in Pakistan where I study, you have the Devobandi. And this one is the Brailvi. And this one is Ahlul Hadith. And this one is Salafi, used to be called Wahhabi. And this one, who is the first of them all, is called the Shia. You divide yourself into different sectarian movements. When Allah commanded, Wala tafarraku. Do not be disunited. And so Dr. Ansari <coughs> advises, stay away from all sectarian labels. And so he proclaimed, and he paid the price for it. <laughs> he says, I am not Deobandi. So the Deobandi is disowned him. I am not Vairavi. So the Vairavi is disowned him. I am not Ahl Hadith. I am not Wahhabi. I am Muslim. That's not good enough for some of them. I am Muslim. If you make the effort to remove yourself from the sectarian divide, then you have credentials to use the Quran and use the person of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam to unite the people. Finally, what he does is to then apply his methodology to the classification of the Sharia and in particular that part of the Sharia which may be called the moral law. Al Ma'aruf wa al Munkar. He argues, and this is also linked to his methodology, that the whole of the Sharia, all the different parts are interlinked with each other. So you cannot study the political Sharia in a vacuum or the economic Sharia or the monetary Sharia in a vacuum. Islamic scholarship must have a familiarity with all the different parts and have the intellectual capacity to bring them all together in an integrated, harmonious whole. That's not easy today. Now, why is it difficult today? Because he argues in this book that the world today is different from every other world we have known. You cannot go back to textbooks that were written a thousand years ago and apply them to today's world. When they do not address the challenges posed by today's world. And so he insists that you must expand your knowledge as a student of Islam to get a grasp, not just superficial knowledge, no more than that, to get a grasp of the very foundations of modern Western civilization. Hmm? <coughs> One Sunday morning, many years ago, Al-Azhar University woke up and rubbed his eyes and then looked down the road and saw something strange. What's that? 
Cairo University. <laughs> Cairo University has been established. Al Azhar has been here for a thousand years. With any without any upstart coming to challenge it. But now this Sunday morning, here is Cairo University. The challenge is now before you. And from that day when Cairo University was established, and the challenge was thrown on the ground, to this day, Al Azhar has not as yet been able to respond to that challenge. Because our institutions of Islamic learning do not give us a curriculum in which we study the philosophical foundations of modern Western civilization. Study is political philosophy. Study is economic philosophy. Study is philosophy of history. What he did, Mawlana Dr. Muhammad Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah, was to establish a new model of an institution of Islamic learning. And he did it in Pakistan, in Karachi, because when the partition took place, he had to leave India. But India before partition, Mus Muslim India produced great scholars. Oh yes! Sometimes Muslim India led the world of Islamic scholarship. So great was scholarship. Because Allah had given to the Indian and to the Persian a certain intellectual gift. <coughs> a certain intellectual gift. He favored them with this gift. He gave to the African a spirituality which is there in their roots. Which is why North African Islam, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, always had that fragrance of spirituality. And so he established the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies in Karachi, Pakistan. And I studied in that institute. And would you believe it? That I had a professor teaching me the philosophy of history? <coughs> And it was because of my studies in the philosophy of history that Alhamdulillah it was possible for me to make penetration of Islamic eschatology. You, you need a number of different subjects to handle in Mu'akhir al-Zaman for eschatology. A number of different subjects. You need Islam, you need international monetary economics for in Mu'akhir al-Zaman. But most of all you need philosophy of history. Al-Azhar University did not respond to that challenge appropriately. And Dr. Ansari argues, you cannot apply the Sharia today. You cannot restore Islam, its foundations and structure, without an appropriate response to the multiple challenges that have come, multiple challenges that have come from modern Western civilization. <coughs> so I have taken you on a talk of the topic. He then went on to classify all the different branches of the Sharia. The political Sharia, the economic Sharia, the Sharia, the personal law, etc. And he classifies them in respect of duties of commission, duties of commission. Al-Awamir wa nawahi and it is the beauty of this book that he organizes all of that material as a whole, a harmonious whole. I would suggest that volume two is where you get the whole Sharia, volume two. This is the easier one. But volume one, where he establishes and argues the intellectual foundations, the metaphysical foundations, the moral foundations, 
You better buy a bottle of Tylenol tablets and keep it at your side. <laughs> because you're going to get a headache with volume one. Let us now then embark upon what is far and away the most important matter that we can dispose. And that is methodology for the study of the Quran in the Hadith. Some of you may be already familiar because you are looking at me every night on YouTube. <laughs> so, so you have to be patient with me because there are others who may not be familiar. So be patient with me. Don't say, oh, I'm good. <laughs> at the very beginning of the Quran, the divine wisdom is it what? In teaching methodology. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not deficient in the use of language. No. Not at all. So when he said, Fasajadu illa Iblis, three words with a preposition. Fasajadu illa iblis he had given a command to the angels al malakika to prostrate before adam alayhi salam the command was given to the angels for such a do and they all made such that elsewhere in the quran he has the word jamia so they all made sijda illa except Iblis. Now, look at the divine wisdom. This is usul al had usul al tafsir, methodology for the study of the Quran to explain the Quran. Usul al tafsir. Look at the divine wisdom. If you use the wrong methodology of taking a verse of the Quran in isolation by itself, stand alone, the Americans call it, or taking a hadith by itself, oh, God and Magab will only be released after Nabi Isa Islam comes and he kills the judge. What nonsense is that Imran Hussein talking about? Why doesn't he shut up? Did he read the hadith? <laughs> if you take a hadith by itself, stand alone, to derive meaning, you can make a mistake. This is wrong methodology. Because over here you will come to the conclusion that Iblis was an angel. Wrong methodology will lead you to the conclusion that Iblis was an angel. Why? That's logical. Logical. If the command was given to angels and they all prostrated, accepted. He had to be an angel. Good. That is wrong methodology. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has constructed this sentence in this way to teach a lesson in methodology. This is not constructed idly. No. The divine wisdom is at work. Now, after having broadcast on CNN and Al Jazeera, you know their sisters, <laughs> <laughs> that Iblis was an angel. Okay? You made your declaration already, the whole world has heard of it. Iblis is an angel, using your perfect logic. Then you open the Quran and you began to read other parts of the Quran. And then you said, oh, oh, oh my, seems as though I'm in trouble. Because here is the Quran saying 
about the angels. The angels have no choice. They have to do what they are ordered to do. So if an angel disobeys, it's no angel at all. Huh? Uh, I know we all like to recognize our wives as angels, <laughs> but if you ask your wife to do something and she says, no, she's not an angel. <laughs> huh? So Iblis, because he disobeyed, could not be an angel. But I've already given the declaration on CNN. And Al Jazeera, I'm feeling very embarrassed now. See? And then in Surah al kahf Allah then says, This is not by accident. And this is at the very beginning of the Quran to teach methodology. That you do not take any verse of the Quran in isolation to study it and derive meaning. Because sometimes you could make a mistake. The proper methodology, says Dr. Ansari, is to go to the whole Quran and locate all the verses, all the data pertaining to the subject. <coughs> and then try to organize that data in a harmonious integrated whole. And since the Quran says about itself, Lokana min that had this Quran come from any source other than from Allah, they would have found in it numerous inconsistencies. But there is nothing inconsistent in the Qur'an. And so if you make the effort with the ayat, for example, pertaining to alcohol, <laughs> you'll be able to locate the consistency that they all form an organic whole and you will not make the mistake of saying, oh, this is mansukh, <laughs> and that is mansukh, abrogated and cancelled. Dr. Ansari says that if you are to bring all of that data together in a harmonious whole, it's like taking pearls and making a necklace. You need the string on which to put the pearls to bind it all together. That analogy of the string, he calls it the system of meaning of the subject. So whatever the subject that you study, after you have located all the verses of the Quran on that subject, you will now have to make that supreme intellectual and spiritual effort to locate the string which binds it all together or the system of meaning. That's not easy sometimes. <laughs> In the Surah to Ali Imran, Allah speaks about two kinds of verses in the Quran. Those which are muhkamat, plain and clear. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ وَالْيَسُمْ With shahr, Ramadan. No two ways about that. It's Ramadan. Tunisia's Habib Burqiba, or Burqiba, may have wanted 
to change it from Ramadan to another month. But in the Quran it's Ramadan. But there are other verses of the Quran which are not plain and clear. Allah describes them as mutashabiha and the meaning of mutashabiha is verses which must be subjected to ta'wil. Ta'wil interpretation. If you are to recognize the mutashabihat, if you are to interpret the mutashabihat, Allah goes on to say, at the beginning of Surah to Ali Imran, that only Allah knows the meaning. Full stop. Oh. Or did the full stop when the Kamal came, come down with Jibra'il al Islam? Did the punctuation in the Quran come down with the angel? Of course not. Of course not. The punctuation did not come down in the revelation. No. So, Allah has preserved the Qur'an. Yes. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَلْنَا الذِّكْرِ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِذُونَ Allah has protected the Qur'an. But, the punctuation in the Qur'an has not come from Allah. It has come from Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. It is in the hadith. And hadith is not guaranteed. <laughs> You can have fabricated hadith. And if you cannot recognize this hadith as fabricated, I think you should send your head to the washing machine. <laughs> the Nabi Muhammad married Aisha anha when she was six. If you accept that hadith, then you must know that it is sunnah to marry a six-year-old child. Let me repeat that. Let me repeat that. If this is correct, then it becomes a sunnah to marry a six-year-old girl. How come you're not doing it? What's wrong with you? Why have you abandoned the sunnah? 1400 years have passed. And for 1400 years you've abandoned the sunnah? What people you are? How come you're not marrying six-year-old girls? When you say this is a valid hadith. Sometimes I got a shout. I will get a beating from my wife afterwards. <laughs> but sometimes I have to shout to wait. <coughs> Is this the sunnah? To marry a six year old? Huh? <laughs> we'll come back to this in a moment, inshallah. It is necessary for us to be able to bring all the verses of the Qur'an together in a harmonious form with no inconsistencies. Locate the system of meaning. And having located the system of meaning, we are now in a position to examine the Mutashabiha. Is it only Allah? Is this full stop correct? The verse goes on to say, and rasikhuna fil ilm. Those who are firmly grounded in knowledge after the word Allah. Dr. Ansari says that full stop is wrong. If that full stop is correct, the implication is that Allah has sent in the Quran verses which even Muhammad does not understand. <laughs> that is not being respectful to Allah. That he should send down a book 
and appoint a teacher who yu'allimuhumu al-kitab and send a teacher authorized to teach the book and the teacher does not know the meaning of many verses of the book. It's an insult of the divine wisdom. That full stop is wrong. Rather, says Dr. Ansari, what the verse is saying, remove the full stop. Only Allah and in addition to Allah, the Rasikhuna Fitan, those who are firmly grounded in knowledge, they are the only ones who know the meaning, the interpretation of these verses which are to be interpreted, mutashabiha. That makes more sense. That there is no verse of the Quran that Muhammad did not understand. That makes more sense, doesn't it? <laughs> the reason why the Rasikhuna fil ilm can penetrate the meaning of the mutashabihat is because they say all is from Allah. The totality is from Allah. And so if you want to understand the part, you've got to penetrate the whole, which is the same methodology that is given. So Mawlana Ansari differs now with the, with the majority about what the Shabi have. He then proceeds to expand the methodology. He said, having located the system of meaning of the subject in the Quran having taken all the verses of the Quran pertaining to that subject now only now not before only now you go to the hadith not before so if you want to study Gog and Magog <laughs> you don't start with the hadith the solitary hadith which you say it means that Gog and Magog will be released, which is false, only after the return of Nabi Isa, which is false. The hadith is the same. That's why Islamic scholarship is today. With this raw methodology. Rather you'll go to the Quran and study all the verses of the Quran pertaining to Gog and Magog. And having accomplished this mission, locate the system of meaning here, yeah, only then would you turn to the hadith, not before. When you turn to the hadith, now you have a criterion, a forgotten, <laughs> with which to be able to distinguish a hadith which are in harmony with the Quran and ahadiths which are in conflict with the Quran. This one about six years of age is manifestly in conflict with the Quran. <laughs> manifestly in conflict with the Quran. And hence this is a fabricated hadith that he married me when I was six. Fabricated hadith. This methodology given by Mawlana Fadl Rahman Ansari is of critical importance to Ikhwan today in Egypt. The enemy ensured that the forces of Islam in Egypt should be battered, persecuted, terrorized for all the long years of Jamal Abdel Nasser. Sayyid Qutub became Shaheed, a great man on a trumped up charge of planning to assassinate Shaman Abdul Nasser, trumped up. And then after the long years of Jamal Abdul Nasser came to an end, a Husni Mubarak came along. And so Ikhwan suffered, not only Ikhwan, the Islamic forces suffered and suffered and suffered in Egypt. Until Israel is now ready to take over from the United States as the next ruling state in the world. 
And in the same way that Pax Americana replaced Pax Britannica, now Pax Judaica wants to replace Pax Americana. You have to read my book, Jerusalem in the Quran, which is outside, to understand this thing. In order for Israel to replace the United States as the next ruling state of the world, and if you don't believe me, just wait. That's all I have to say. Just wait. Because I'll be studying Islamic eschatology. I know what are their plans. <coughs> I hope they don't succeed. But the evidence is there, they are succeeding. I don't want them to succeed. No. But the evidence is there, they are succeeding. Largely because the ulama of Islam are eating tetaric, they are drinking tetaric and eating rotisserie. Yeah. Yeah. When the moment was right, because Israel now needs causes better, a justification for waging war on Egypt, hmm? so that the territory of the state of Israel can expand to encompass the biblical frontiers of Al Abdul Muqaddas. So they want to take the eastern delta of Egypt. So you need a justification for war. So that's when you make a deal with Ikhwan. And Ikhwan has suffered so much that if Ikhwan fall for the trap. And then you have the Arab Spring. <coughs> and then you can close your eyes and predict Ikhwan is going to win the election. That's no surprise to anybody. <laughs> and then because the Quran still does not have control over Egypt, the military is still there powerful, the judiciary is still there powerful, some very fortunate events come along to help the Quran. A fortunate event like 16 Egyptian police officers being killed in Ramadan. Okay, Quran, now's the time, cut him. And the Minister of Defense is fired. Armed Forces Chief of Staff is fired. Military is cut down to size. Ikhwan succeeds. Very fortunate, eh? 16 police officers. <laughs> and now the judiciary. So very convenient attack on Gaza. Brutal attack on Gaza. And then Egypt becomes the mediator between the oppressor and the oppressed. Oh my gosh. Look at that. I always thought that Islam came to liberate the oppressed. I never knew that Islam came to mediate between the oppressor and the oppressed. If someone else has to do the mediation, fine, not us. What we can have is a direct dialogue between oppressor and oppressed for a hudna, a truth, like Arabia. And as soon as this is, it was established, and Mursi is basking in the sunshine, you cut the throat of the, 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 the judiciary. Hmm. Now, Egypt is being set up to be slaughtered. But the Quran cannot see that. Cannot see that. Sharia has to be enforced in Egypt. That's the plan. When the Sharia is enforced in Egypt, I said this about a year ago, you know. It's there on YouTube, you can listen. They were to pay an Egyptian family to bring a six-year-old girl before the Sharia court for marriage, nikah, with a man who is 55. Sharia court, using the wrong methodology, cannot recognize this hadith that fabricated. And so they will say, Jais. Oh, yes. And then CNN and Al Jazeera will capture that marriage ceremony. And they will be playing it all over the world on every television station over and over and over again. And Muslims are going to become the laughing stock of the whole world. When I explained this to Dr. Muhammad Mahathir, 
former Prime Minister of, Egypt, of Malaysia. He said to me, we are already, we are already the laughing stock of the world. So I said, Dr. Mahathir, can I quote you on that? He said, yes, you can quote me. If you wrong, if you use the wrong methodology, you will end up with that tragedy. Another tragedy waiting, a time bomb waiting to explode because of wrong methodology. The Israeli Mossad is going to pay an Egyptian woman who is married, she has a husband. And an Egyptian man who is married, he has his wife to come before the Sharia court and to confess to Zina. Once there is a confession, you don't need any witnesses. No confession! The Sharia court will now have to decide. And the New York Times will devote the whole of the front page <laughs> to the case. The whole world will be watching. And the Sharia court will have to decide. And using the wrong methodology, incapable of recognizing a fabricated hadith, will have to say that the punishment for these two is Rajab. And when that stoning to death takes place, CNN and Al Jazeera will capture it. And they're going to play it on every single television station in the world. And all of mankind are going to be turning away from Islam with disgust. And many Muslims will be leaving Islam out of any parts. Hmm? This is the tragedy waiting to occur because of incorrect methodology. And so, I urge you, because you are young, I urge you at this time to adopt the correct methodology. And this is not easy. No, it's time consuming. It requires an intellectual effort. It requires effort as a researcher to locate all the data. And when you have located all the data and the system of meaning which binds it together, when you find the hadith which is in conflict, you turn away from that hadith. Dr. Ansari not only explained this methodology, but he went on to emphatically declare that the status of the Quran is to sit in judgment over the hadith. Quran and hadith are not, they don't share the same status. No. The Quran sits in judgment over the hadith. The Quran is the only authority which has absolute authenticity. Only God. Not even the best ahadith have that status of absolute authenticity. And so to conclude, if there is a conflict or even the appearance of a conflict between the Quran and any hadith, it is with the Quran that we must stay. We now turn to the spirituality that is essential. If you are to locate that system of meaning, sometimes you cannot grasp it through only a rational exercise. No. Every scientist knows that the major advances of science were nearly always made through insight. 
A scientist will be working on the problem for years. He's done 